Szevasztok, kávéra jön Gokin, Kun Friás vagyok, ez pedig itt a Kávés Doboz Vlog, és hát mellette már egy barátom, akit talán már egy előző videóból ismerhettek, Debrecenbe jártunk együtt, Ávézoltán barátommal. És milyen jót kávéztunk? Így van. És hát Zolit nem csak onnan ismerhetitek, hogy eljött velem Debrecenbe, hanem egyébként egy csomó minden jót csinál Egerben. A nevéhez köthető az Egri Gasztro tavasz, ami hamarosan lesz, illetve az ő nevéhez köthető az Egri Utcazenész Fesztivál. Így van. De most nem azért vagyunk itt a Tampentúl előtt Budapesten a Váci úton, hanem azért vagyunk itt, hogy egy világbajnokkal beszélgessünk. És hát ugye rólam talán tudni vélik egyetetten, hogy társalgási szinten annyira nem vágom az angolt. Viszont Zoltán barátom meg egész perfekten beszélik, úgyhogy most őt kértem meg, hogy segítsen nekünk abban, hogy Dielherisszel tudjunk egy picit beszélgetni. Megígérem, hogy kihozom magamból a legjobbat, de azon túl, hogy találkozhatom a világbajnokkal, hát ha nem maragszol, én azért is jöttem ide, hogy legalább igyak egy finom kávét. Én azt mondom, vágjunk is bele, menjünk ide, be, mert mindjárt kezdődik az előadás, Így és van. nekünk előtte még végeznünk kell. Hi there, this is the Coffee Box Next episode, and as you can see, we are sitting here in the Tampen Pool Coffee Bar at Budapest, and uh, the most important person is sitting right next to me, it's Dale Harris, uh, the, may I say, the, the champion. Yes, yeah, that's Bad, good enough. <laughs> the Weltmeister, the Weltmeister of the Boris Championship 2017. Yeah. Okay, it was in uh, Seoul. As that's far. right, yeah. In yeah, South that's Korea. right, okay. So, Dale, um, is this the first time in Hungary for you? No, it's, uh, I've been to Budapest maybe, uh, it's the fifth time. It's like coming home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And most of the time you visit only the capital or uh, have you ever uh, traveled in the, to the countryside? So, so far it's been Budapest only, so oh, okay. <laughs> I hope. What is your personal preference uh, if, if we think about the coffee bars, I mean uh, uh, the interior? Do you like this kind of uh, industrial one, or, or what is the uh, what is your uh, atmosphere preference? So I quite enjoy uh, as I as I travel, I get to travel a lot now, which is lots of fun. I like the cafes I visit to feel tied to the space. Okay. So I kind of uh, this industrial kind of appearance I enjoy because it matches my idea of Budapest. Whether that's fair or not, yeah. I don't know, um, but. I don't want to. I don't want to walk into a cafe and feel like it's London or it's Melbourne or it's wherever. I want to feel like I'm in Budapest and I'm, I'm seeing coffee here. Oh, and okay. I think, the way a cafe feels or the way a cafe looks can be very separate to the quality of coffee it offers. And uh, by the way, is there a big difference between the Hungarian coffee bars or Hungarian coffee culture? We may talk about it, uh, and and the uh, other countries. I mean, Western so, Europe. I think. Every country has a slightly different take. I think maybe espresso and you know strong black coffee okay. resonates more strongly here than it does in you know the UK has been very much led by the chains. So even when you're talking quality, it's cappuccino and it's latte and instant coffee culture. And mm -hmm. I know that cafes are always a reaction to what people drink at home. It has to be different. It has to be interesting enough that people will go out of their way to spend money. And so it's, you know, the coffee that people will pay money for in Paris is very different to the coffee people will pay money for in, you know, Budapest or in Korea or in America. It's, okay. I find that really interesting. Regarding to that, uh, you are the, the champion of the yes. last year. And uh, uh, what was the, the, you must be a, a coffee enthusiast. I think you must be. <laughs> <laughs> you must be. Uh, that what was the first time for you that you have met the coffee culture and, and you just fall in love in yeah. so seriously? So I think a lot of people have that, that one cup yeah. that they tasted and it opened their eyes to this whole new world. And when was it? Uh, Four years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually for me it was, it was less that one moment and it was the steady progression. So at first, uh, you know, I drank instant coffee and then I drank filter coffee and I was learning a little more. 
there was, was an really, evolution for you. Yeah, yeah I okay. fell in love with cafes, and then I fell in love with making espresso and the, you know, the technology and the skill. And then I started falling into this filter coffee culture, where coffee actually had real distinct flavors, and it was less about the person making it, okay. and more about where the coffee had come from. And um, uh, how did you get in connection with Hasbeam? Because uh, if, if uh, somebody knows the coffee world, that must know that you yeah. are the Hasbeam man. So one, I, one of the Hasbeam man. Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am maybe the second Hasbeam man. We have, oh, yeah. we have Steve, who is, uh, is our head roaster, and our head buyer. Um, and I find Steve actually through competition. So I was looking for... Uh, I had developed my skills in making coffee, and the limit I was hitting was I didn't have access to really amazing coffee. And friends who were also competing or working in coffee were like, well, there's this guy called Steve. He's really small, but he has exceptional coffee. Uh, so competition led me to him. Okay. Uh, and it just, it just reached this moment that I was looking for an opportunity where I would reach better coffee. And he was looking for somebody who would fill gaps in his business. Okay. And so it was just a perfect fit. And uh, at that time when you have met, uh, yeah. uh, when you have met, uh, how long had uh, you been already practicing this uh, barista? So uh, I started in coffee profession. in maybe 2006, 2007, okay. but working with, you know, a big chain, actually with Costa, who I didn't know have a big presence in Hungary, you know, just working as a barista, wiping tables. Uh, I joined Hasbeam in 2010, uh, and in between I'd done some some cafe management roles, some engineering roles, some training roles. Okay. And uh, what, what is your position or title now in the Hasbeam company? So my, since I started, my title has been the same. So I've always been director of wholesale. Okay. But once, like when I first started, it was looking after everything that a cafe might need. So if it was raising an invoice or processing an order or delivering a box or fixing a broken grinder, I would do everything. Okay. Uh, now I look after a small team of people, including you know, some really good trainers, some guys working in the back of the office. And most of my job now is supporting them rather than you know, doing all the work. Yeah, but, but uh, if, if uh, we look uh, from this uh, side, uh, it's, it's mostly a back office. Thing. Yeah, but uh, you must be in the practice. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, so how do you do that? I think uh, after work you go and <laughs> make some coffee bit, all the time. A little bit. Um, most of the work I do will be, you know, visiting sites and talking about coffee or thinking about coffee, and you have to have the skills to back it up. So I'm constantly working on coffee in my own time, and be that just you know spending a few hours behind the espresso machine, making the time for it every week. Uh, we're also brewing filter coffee every day, tasting coffee every day. Um, my, let's say my back office role is not to do the paperwork, but is to, to guide the people in the idea of what has been should be. On the championship, uh, you choose uh, not the uh, so-called geisha uh, coffee that everybody chooses. It's a really very high quality, uh, but uh, you choose uh, another way. Yeah. What was your opinion about it? Uh, what was the idea about that? It, it's a, a quite big risk. So, I mean, I, I chose a coffee yeah. just based on how it tasted. There was no, there was no agenda. The, uh, the direction of not using a geisha wasn't, wasn't a planned one. But as we cut coffees and tasted coffees, there was one I found that I believed okay. had the... The profile that matched what I look for in an, in an espresso uh, better than anything else. Okay. And we tasted geishas, but I discounted them because if, if and I'm not sure how many of your viewers understand what geishas are, but geishas are a, a low-yielding, high-quality variety that thrives in certain areas and produces a cup of coffee mm -hmm. that doesn't really taste like we think coffee should taste. It's super floral, it's super light and tea-like. Uh, and it can be incredible. Uh, and it's definitely been associated with high prices, so lots of baristas have used this as you know, the gold standard of what coffee should be. Uh, the challenge is, if everybody's using a geisha, if everybody is pushing this idea of coffee tasting their way, if everyone's using the same description of it tastes like jasmine and tea, yeah. only one coffee can taste the most of jasmine and tea. It's not a particular flavor profile that I enjoy in espresso, but it's also it's not 
to me interesting anymore. We've so tasted this. Your idea is to be a little bit different. Yeah, to or to to find a coffee that that allowed me to talk about different things. Okay. So it was a coffee from El Salvador. Uh, it was a little more traditional in cup profile, but it was also still arguably rare. It was a, a specific variety grown in you know, very high altitude, very specific conditions. So I can't pretend it was completely democratic and it be, could be grown any, anywhere and taste the same. But what it could be was uh, a different idea of what quality can be. Okay. And I think that it, it, it opens up the potential of coffee a little more because the challenge isn't that it's, it tastes like X or it tastes like Y. The, the reality is coffee has the potential to taste of a hundred different things. And we need that variety. That's, mm -hmm. that's the most exciting thing we have over other products. Okay, and uh, tell us, please, tell us the truth. Was it a more than tactic thing to choose this or it came from your heart? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was definitely from the heart. I think... Yeah, I that was the right one. <laughs> that was the right answer. Uh, I think I can look at it uh, now and I can see, you know, maybe there was there was advantage to the choice or there was benefit, but I was in this position where I, I competed in the UK lots of years running. Okay. And just once I had a chance to compete at the Worlds. And oh, yeah. it was my belief that I would never have another chance. Okay, uh, so, so you take the risk. You took the so, risk. Just to present something, because the chances of winning were so small, instead, whatever I do, I want to be proud of it. I want to be excited by it. And, and that decision, that risk, is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present what I want to present. Um, that actually took away lots of risk. It was, well, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to try this and try this and try this, and I'm just going to own my choices okay. and see where they, where they lead me. And there was a chance at the very beginning that either it would be They would hate it or they would love it, and I was lucky enough that they loved it. It resonated at the right time. Yeah, so. in, in this uh, opinion, I think the championship, uh, I mean, the, that you uh, became the, the uh, world champion is, was a result, not, not an aim. Yeah. yeah. So now you, as far as I know, you are the uh, ambassador <laughs> yes. of the, of the uh, coffee world. Of, mm -hmm. So what is your credo as an ambassador? Okay, so... Let's say I now have this opportunity that, that lots of people ask me questions about uh -huh. coffee. You know, I am, I am a go-to person for the internet, for journalists, for whatever. Um, and in reality, every barista ends up being an ambassador for coffee. You know, every time you serve coffee to a customer, you effectively represent the whole coffee industry. Okay. So yeah, I get to represent ideas in coffee. Um, I think the real... The real goal of that role is to promote some of the ideas of specialty. Uh, and it's okay if I don't succeed in getting them all across to everybody all the time because so I have to, f I have to tailor the message to the audience and try and communicate some of the very basic values which are, you know, fresh coffee is good. That there is more to the flavor of coffee than the act of roasting. Now comes a question that uh, may be cut out uh, of, <laughs> of, of the video. That what do you think about those people? How they, snobbish, you know? That, yeah. yeah, they are talking about all the time the coffee. They have no clue about it, but want to show that. that yes. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you think about the snobbish coffee? Snobbish. Well, so I don't think this is a coffee problem. I think this is a a society problem. Oh, okay. So you have the same with wine. You know, you go to a wine tasting. Yeah, yeah. There's someone who knows better. I who came from the money. capital of the Hungarian wine. <laughs> yeah, from Eger. Okay. So I think you can. Everybody has a preference in coffee. You know, everybody has their history with coffee, the thing they grew up with, uh, the lessons they were taught earlier. And when you're trying to overcome the obstacle of somebody, somebody was told something or trained in something that doesn't quite match with your thing, mm -hmm. it's a really difficult, you know, you're, you're butting heads and you are fighting. Um, and when I talk about baristas with service, I try and help them avoid those situations. You don't need to be right. You don't mm -hmm. need to be better than the customer. And some customers will be noisier than others. And you don't need to listen to the noisy ones over <laughs> the quiet ones. What you need to do is, or, or what I hope to do when I'm working with customers, is create a, a comfortable environment where you can have a conversation, where it's not about whether someone's right or whether it's the best coffee, 
but it's, you know, what are we tasting right now? What are you enjoying? And what is it, why is it that you like this flavor? Or is it, you know, why are we describing it this way or that way? It doesn't need to be the binary, this is right and this is wrong, because that shuts more doors than it opens. That's my okay. opinion. <laughs> yeah, uh, what, and what do you think that, what are the best practice uh, of the coffee barn owners? What can you suggest to them uh, to educate people? Uh, to to consume the coffee, that, uh, to enjoy coffee on the right way. And you know, yeah. when the new wave coffee came into Hungary, yeah. and uh, may I say that uh, nowadays it's, it's still the, the same situation that most of the people uh, cannot deal with this uh, very uh, acid uh, yeah. uh, taste. But of course we know, of course we know that this is, uh, well this is the the, the point of the quality. This, yeah. yeah. This is so, a sign of the quality. I think the first thing is understand that there is both a wide range of customers with a wide range of needs and there's also a wide range of coffee. Mm -hmm. So the joy for me of, of specialty coffee is not that it tastes particularly acidic or particularly chocolatey or particularly anything. It's that there are hundreds of coffees and hundreds of flavors that are available and you can push in one direction or another, no business is forced to choose one coffee. Open cuppings and open tastings oh, okay, yeah. where people have the ability to, to begin to change their preferences or shape their preferences. You know, many of the shops we've worked with really successfully have had a safe coffee that's easy and no one will ask questions about, but it's good, and a wild or incredible or a different coffee, and that could be a geisha, or that could be a super, you know, chocolatey, earthy Indonesian. Uh, both of those can be quality. Okay. Makes sense? I have two last questions. Uh, one is uh, that, uh, what do you think is going to be the two very important milestones in the future, in the near future, in the international barista, in the international coffee world? Uh, I think the first one is kind of boring. There will be a wider acceptance of quality coffee. The second one, I think, whilst I want coffee to be democratic and more affordable for lots of people, I want everyone to share in this. What, uh, what is going on around us? Because by the time that we have talked, uh, yeah. a lot of people sit in. <laughs> they get in. So what's going to happen uh, in the next few hours? I don't know, t tonight... Or, or maybe they are uh, here because of me. And <laughs> <They're> <laughs> most, most probably they are your, your likers and your followers. No, no, no. <laughs> I think uh, tonight, so, uh, so Atel and David uh, invited me over to, to come and see the shops, which I kind of do every year and okay. spend some time. But they wanted to open it up to, to all the baristas in, in Budapest. So we're having a bit of a workshop, a bit of a QA. and a I've... I successfully got out of doing a slideshow because I hate them, <laughs> and instead it's, uh, it's going to be talking a little bit about my experiences, but also trying to answer questions of the community here. Because the idea is like, I can, I can do some interviews, I can talk to one or two people at a time, but if I can talk to 50, 60 baristas, and then they go out and have success either in competition or they run cuppings or they do whatever, and some of, some of the ideas that I've shared with them spread even further, then we begin to create that, that real movement, that revolution. Okay. You know, that's the idea. Yeah, it's a great plan. <laughs> and this revolution starts here in the Temp and Pool Coffee. Dale, thank you very much for the interview thank you. and for the conversation. And don't forget, follow us on Facebook and, and every channel, Coffee Box. Ciao. <laughs>